What's going on, everybody? Good evening. What's going on, Shanks, Cam Lesh? Welcome in, everybody. We're going to get this going in just a couple of minutes. What's going on, Husky? Welcome in, everybody. What up, Bobby? Welcome in, everybody. We're going to get this going in just a couple of minutes. All right. Anybody have anything interesting going on today? Nothing too special in my court. Tried a little bit of Amazon earlier, but just a low volume week, so nothing too uh, interesting to expect there. Nice close on it, though. Wow. few killer trades. Nice. Nice, Travis. Very cool. Happy to hear it. Looks like uh, tomorrow's going to be a little bit interesting. Been a low volume week. Friday's closed. So, Mandy Car says snow. That's what Shark was talking about, right? I think he was looking for that close over 160. Oh, look at that after hours. Wow. That's crazy. And Shark just talked about the April 19 calls too. Wow, that's crazy. Gotta love Shark, dude. He's got the, always got the perfect, perfect timing. He sent that message right around there. Yeah, that's crazy. That's cool to see. Yeah, I mean, just been holding that daily point of control. I mean, Shark's not lying. It's just from a risk to reward standpoint, your risk is 158. So, um, yeah, you stay above that and uh, not too much of a reason to be short, at least. Maybe the CEO. Is that what the news was on Snow? The CEO bought shares or what? It looks like something hit after hours. I mean, somebody did something. Let's see. Oh, yeah. A CEO bought of <laughs> Five million worth of shares. Wow. That's so crazy. And they bought them today, too. Yep. Shark just knows, dude. Shark just knows. All right. Well, it's a couple minutes after the hour. I'm going to send out one more message, letting everybody know we're getting started, and we'll get right into it. All 
All right. All right, let's get right into it. Welcome in everybody. Welcome to the lecture for the evening. Oh, I block plus. Uh, welcome to the lecture for the evening. Uh, last week we were meant to talk about support and resistance, but we had a quick change of plans, decided to talk a little bit about the FOMC uh, and ended up spending the lecture on that. Um, but today we're gonna focus on support and resistance. This is a topic that I think many people have covered both on YouTube, both in lectures here. Uh, and I'd like to think I have my own kind of unique spin on how to cover support and resistance. And ideally we can give you uh, some of this information that's generally presented in the same way uh, in just a bit different of a way uh, and also provide some information or different types of analogies or comparisons that you haven't heard before. So with that said, uh, I won't waste too much time on the introduction here. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, this is all part of our beginners course series. So we're here at lecture number four at this point. So we've gone through uh, the first few lectures. So if you haven't gotten the chance to see those, I highly recommend taking a look at those, spending some time to review uh, the lectures that we've gone over so far in this year. Um, and we're gonna move in today with support resistance and we got a long course list ahead, at least a couple months uh, of continued beginners course series lectures. I always like to remind everybody, although these beginners course series are labeled for beginners, it, it definitely can provide value um, for those of all skill levels. So certainly not just limited to beginners uh, and definitely something that I think anybody could take uh, something new away from. So that being said, uh, just a couple things that I want to remind everybody about before we begin. Uh, generally, these lectures are all kind of guided with the PowerPoint that you're looking at now. This specific lecture is gonna be a little less heavy on the PowerPoint and a little bit heavier on the examples. Uh, so we'll introduce the concept of support and resistance, talk a little bit about some of the kind of deeper meaning or um, I'll call it uh, constructive ideas behind support and resistance. And then we'll get right into a bunch of different examples. So support and resistance, it can be a really simple topic, but there's a lot more to understand uh, than just drawing lines on the chart if you want there to be. Uh, so we'll focus on kind of that deeper meaning in the class tonight. That said, uh, let's not waste any more time and get right into it. If you guys have any questions that come up during the class, uh, go ahead and throw them in the chat. I'll do my best to get to it as soon as I can. And if I miss it, uh, just send it again. and Hopefully I'll see it the second time. All right, uh, getting started with support and resistance here. Um, really simple, this is just kind of a definition slide. Um, these are terms I think probably most people have either seen or heard somewhere else. Uh, support is a level where buyers are prompted to purchase a security and resistance is a level where sellers are prompted to sell a security. Uh, the reason that I say security is because there's a lot more than just stocks uh, that obey support resistance. It's something that you could pretty commonly see in the crypto market, definitely uh, pretty heavy on the technicals over there, uh, as well as sometimes in the derivatives market as well. So it could be futures, uh, and in, in rare occasions, sometimes you even see options uh, kind of behaving uh, or respecting some support and resistance levels. Now, that's that's a little bit more of a niche idea that we're not going to uh, cover too much this evening. But that's the reason that I chose the term security here instead of stocks. Uh oh, flips. Uh oh. What's up, flips? Good, brother. How are you? Good, dude. You snuck in. I'm just here for the ride. I'm here to learn. You oh, no, there's nothing you're learning tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Let me work in resistance and supports. It's uh yeah, it's I mean it's it's the most important part of any trading strategy, and I think you could agree. Yeah, hundred percent. Yep. Well, if you have anything to say, feel free to chime in and uh, interrupt. One hundred. All right, brother. Maybe we'll talk about one of your trades. I, I'm sure you use support and resistance this week. I, I don't think you're in BC today, but. I'm sure at some point this week you've uh, used some support and resistance, maybe on AMD or uh, Tesla or something. I used it on AMD uh, maybe yesterday or the day before on the triple bottom, and then I used it today on VWAP on XPX, the big move at the end of the day. Beautiful. Well, we'll we'll take a look at that All after right. we do this beginner intro, and we'll have you do a little trade recap if you're down. You join, so so he signs up to be a part of it. Uh, always show some love to Flips, everybody, for being here. He he just shows up randomly. Nobody asks him to be here, but everybody wants him here. Uh, so show some love to Flips for pulling up. If you guys aren't joining VC with Flips, I, I'm i not, not really sure what you're doing. So 
<laughs> yeah, thanks for joining Flips. All right, um, so the basics of support and resistance, really, as I mentioned, we have these kind of rough definitions here uh, where support is generally a level where we, it's common to see stocks or equities bounce, and resistance is a level where it's common to see stocks or equities sell off. And the most important question uh, to kind of ask yourself here and, and for us to discuss is why do investors decide to buy or sell at specific levels? And there can be a lot of reasons for this, and we won't always be able to answer this question. However, some common reasons why investors are going to buy or sell is maybe the company is priced at a good value at that level. Like, for example, the price to earnings ratio or price to sales ratio is at a favorable level um, close to a specific price level. Uh, or maybe there is just a, a level that investors have been purchasing equities in the past. Like, for example, T, uh, the $14 level is a place where investors have been purchasing um equity for over 20 years. Um, same with uh, maybe like an analyst profit target. Like for example, maybe the uh, analyst said that it's headed to 20. So maybe once it hits 20, there's going to be a lot of people that sell there. Uh, and also a really common one is the psychological numbers. Um, so something like 100, 200, 300, et cetera. So those are just a couple of reasons why investors might buy or sell at specific levels. Now, I want to introduce a concept that maybe you haven't heard before and maybe other a, a different type of concept that other people might not have introduced to you yet. One thing to note about support and resistance is investors and really the biggest money and smart money uh, is always going to be buying the lows and selling the highs. Very simply put, they always know the perfect time to buy and the perfect time to sell because they are trading with amounts of money that truly move financial markets. So what might that look like? And I think snow is even a great place to start um, just by looking at this example here. Um, so for example, if we take a look at the volume profile, something that I pay attention to all the time, uh, one of my favorite ways to find key levels, just from the volume profile alone, you can see these nodes uh, here sticking out on the chart. And these nodes represent the amount of volume traded at a specific price level. And we can see here that this volume profile over the last year is very heavily skewed at the lows, right? You can see here the bulk of investors were trading snow near the lows and much less people were trading near the highs, right? Which ultimately seems like it makes sense, right? Once we reach these highs, price ended up reverting back to these lows where the stock became a more attractive buy. Now, um, the point that I'm trying to make here is that you want to be looking for this type of accumulation or moves to significant key levels in the past. And just looking at this pink line right here, we can see how price has respected this level over the past year. Clearly, it's been an important spot. And even over the past couple of days, it's been somewhere important to be paying attention to. And this is a pattern that you see repeated over and over and over again on every single time frame. And it's important to note that as price comes into these key levels of support or key levels of resistance, there's going to be clues for us to look for when determining if buyers or sellers are either accumulating or distributing their positions at these areas. Some things that we can look for is wicks into these areas. So for example, maybe some long upside wicks in these areas indicate that there's sellers still present at this zone. Or maybe we see high volume in these areas. Like for example, here we see this high volume as we break through this level of prior support. Right. That's something to note. And those are the types of clues that we can really dig into just a bit deeper. Uh, and again, this is something that can be done on every single time frame. Our analysts are doing it on literally every single trade. And support and resistance is arguably the number one piece of any trade, as every trade that we take is defined based off of a specific price target, specific profit targets, specific um, or excuse me, specific entry targets, specific profit targets, and specific stop loss. And every single one of those are going to be a level, right? And it could be any level, but you want your trade to be based off of the most important levels that you could possibly find. And again, the way to do that is always going to be your technical analysis and understanding how to find those high quality support and resistance levels. So just a couple examples on the PowerPoint here, um, really simplified example here, um, but this gets the big idea of support and resistance across. Uh, you can see here, support is generally a level where an equity bounces or finds buyers and resistance is generally a level where an equity finds sellers. And support and resistance can turn into each other. Like for example, this level previously was resistance. When price peak breaks above it, now that level will turn into support. And generally, that's a pretty common occurrence. Uh, and you'll see this same idea repeated over and over and over again. Uh, as, as always, there's nothing new in the stock market. And 
pretty much everything you see uh, has always happened once or twice before at minimum. And things like sport resistance happen thousands of times a day. There's thousands of bounces off of key levels every single day. Uh, it's just a matter of being in the right place at the right time and finding those levels on the stocks that you like to trade. A couple more examples here in increasing complexity. Uh, same idea, again, you know, a little bit of a blurry chart, but wanted to just get it in the PowerPoint. Uh, here you can see that same type of horizontal level illustration where we can see as we approach these support and resistance levels, it's pretty common uh, to see some kind of signal bar right, which signifies uh, if we're setting up for a rejection or a bounce. Like for example, on this first bounce of support, you can see some long downside wicks forming. On this first breakdown through that support, you see no long downside wick. And in fact, it's a big bear bar with the bear bar closing near its low, uh, which was likely something that had occurred on high volume. Uh, and then a rejection of that same resistance level. Um, once we break below that, we revisit that resistance level, still those same uh, sellers present once again. Uh, and you can get the idea um, from there. Now, another important thing to mention is a lot of different things can act as support and resistance levels. Like, for example, you might see a horizontal trend line that is drawn like a support resistance level. For the purposes of this class, we're only going to focus on horizontal lines as we have uh, plenty of other classes looking at trend lines or looking at moving averages uh, or otherwise. Uh, but yeah, for the purpose of this class, we're mainly going to focus on the horizontal resistance lines. But it's important to note that you could consider trend lines or EMAs uh, to also be support and resistance. That said, uh, that's really the introduction of support and resistance there. Does anybody have any questions on what we just discussed, what that means, why it matters? What do we think? Rudy feels good. He's got the green frogs in the chat. He's happy. Bobby's feeling good. All right. Cool. So we'll continue to emphasize those points that we just covered there in the introduction. Um, oh, this is a good question. Uh, what time frames are best to look for support resistance? So I wouldn't say that there's one time frame that's necessarily better than another. Uh, and the reason I'll say that is because every time frame can give you completely valid support and resistance levels. That said, support and resistance levels that you get from the higher time frames are much more significant from the support than the support and resistance levels that you get from the lower time frames. And what I mean by that is, as I mentioned in the last lecture on candlesticks, these higher time frames consist of much more data. Like for example, every single one of these candles took five days or a, a trading week to form with much more volume. Whereas if we zoom in onto something like the hour, all of these candles only took an hour to form, right? So the volume in every single one of these bars is gonna be much lower than that of the higher timeframes. So that's really the big idea is it's, it's kind of data backed, right? Anything on the higher timeframes is always gonna be more significant than that on the lower timeframes. But that's not to say that you could find perfectly valid levels um, that are actually from the higher time frames and see them on the lower time frames. Like for example, this 158 level, if we take a look at the hourly, it's probably a level that we would have been able to figure out, right? Looking at the hourly, we got a couple wicks off of the same area, right? Yesterday, uh, yesterday's lows and even a wick around today's lows and even another nice level off the hourly is this 157 spot. So um, definitely not the only way to find levels, um, but always the higher time frame levels are going to be the, um, yeah, more significant. Um, do you draw your support and resistance lines off the wicks or the bodies of candles? It depends, right? If I'm drawing something like a point of control, which generally is actually auto plotting, um, I'll put it wherever it is. So like, for example, this level, which is the point of control from the volume profile, it's at 158. So I'm going to replot it at 158 so I can see it at every time frame, right? So in that case, I'm not really looking at the bars. I'm looking more at the volume profile. Next example would be uh, something like a psychological support. Like for example, 200, if I'm just gonna mark this 200, I don't really care um, you know, what it's touching. I just know that 200 is usually gonna be something significant. Flip syncs his mic doesn't work. Your mic was working earlier. You wanna try again? Okay, there, 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 I got it, I got it. <laughs> All right, all right. Uh, but in terms of like actually looking at the bars and plotting support and resistance, it usually depends. Uh, for me, I, I've seen, I feel like I tend to plot more off of the wicks. 
So for example, uh, this right here would be the level for me based off of these two wicks touching that exact same area. And you'll notice up here, there's bodies touching that same level. Um, but that's not to say that sometimes bodies are also completely valid as well. Something like Marvell, you can see that first wick here at that 68 level was kind of that first time that level showed its importance. Uh, but ultimately, we got a couple bodies off that same area. Same thing with this orange level. A couple bodies off this area, a couple wicks. Uh, so I, I, I find myself tending to have kind of a mix of both. Um, but generally, I, I feel like when I'm looking for levels, it always starts with a wick. Unless I'm charting something like a gap. Like, for example, these gaps are just starting from the tops of the bodies there. Great question, though. So. All right, Flips. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. So while you're here, I want to ask you a little bit about how you recently used support and resistance in one of your trades. Because I'm sure everybody wants to hear that. Oh, man. Um, let's see. Let's pick one that we did. I think it was yesterday. So yesterday? No, I think uh, fuck. Monday. We did Monday AMD calls. All right. So if you look at AMD, um, it had the news. And AMD, everybody knows that is a bullish stock right now. Chips are hot. They've been hot for a while. And so if you go to AMD on Monday on pre-market, you notice that it created a base like 172.6 or so. Let me see. I got it open in. Right about there. Yep. 172.7. Yep. Right there. So what I was looking for, again, this is resistance support, but it goes hand to hand with something that Tosi likes to do is volume. So we saw when the first five minute candle dropped uh below the 172.6, um, the volume became extremely bullish. The calls that were getting in in that little wick was extremely bullish. So I literally called out AMD at 172.6. And we bought them there for like I think like 116 and we wrote the the goal was to uh to write the entire wick that we had on pre market that whole wick all the way up. Oh. Yeah. So we wrote we wrote that the entire wick uh chopping you know taking levels uh, across the board the levels came from the hourly, and then we played a little flag uh as well on the top uh, over the wick. Uh, down which down, down down uh right there. Right. No, 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 no. You see that the top of the wick? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right that, that flag right there. So usually you have, a, after a big bullish run, you have about a 15-minute consolidation. And those are those three inside red candles back to the 9 EMA. I don't know. I think that's your 9. The, yep, the, yep. Okay, there you go. You see, that's usually what happens. So you have a big bullish run, and then you have a 15-minute consolidation, and that's when you bought the second time. And then we wrote again, I think, to like 161.6. I think I, it was one of my levels. And that's it. That was the two two big trades, how to use resistance and support. So this, I mean, really simple, right? All you're looking for was this pre-market consolidation, right? I mean, certainly not looking amazing in pre-market, right? I mean, bad Correct. news in the morning, right? Nothing crazy. One thing that I want to point out about this one, too, is that it also came back to a big daily support level in this same period. If you look back, I mean, really, this wick right here, 174, is those prior daily lows, right? So big wick off that level um, last week in the, that 174 area. And I think that's also from the weekly, too. No, not quite. Uh, maybe I have a different level that's from the weekly. No, nope, never mind. A little lower. Anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, another great part about that is it was in, you know, a couple different levels, right? Sitting right there at that 174 from the weekly, um, right between it, and then also just forming that base right around there on the five minute. I mean, it just ended up setting up for kind of that perfect move above. And even if you didn't catch it at the bottom, like flips does, I mean, you certainly could have bought it on that break above, uh, back above that big weekly support, uh, let alone this pre-market range that formed right around that same area too. So, I mean, a lot of reasons to certainly not be bearish on AMD uh, after that first five minute bar alone. That's an excellent example. Thanks, Flips. Manny Car says Tesla. Do you you take you took Tesla this week too, right, Flips? Yeah, we did Tesla as well. 
You want to talk about that one? Yeah, let me. I have that trade. I had it written down in my notes because I take notes on everybody's trades. <laughs> um, so we did Tesla. Uh, I believe that was uh the same day, and we did it on the day after that. But if you go back to Monday, um, so you look at Tesla, and there's a gap on pre market. If you notice again, the bottom of the gap. Uh, let me see if I it so I can look over what you're showing. Okay, perfect, perfect. Right there, right there. So you see that the left candle all the way at the end, the green candle? Yeah. All the to, all, no, all the way to the left on pre-market. More? More? Oh, okay. here. Yep. Get, get uh, right on level on the bottom of it. Correct. And look at that, what happened on pre-market the last five minutes right before market opened. Yep. So then, then you write uh, on the wick. So you see that you see that you have like a like a the, the top I think it was like one sixty nine point eight or something, it was that that little flag on the downside. One sixty nine point eight, like here. Now, this, is, this is still on pre market. Oh, pre market, pre market here. Right up, 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 right there. Correct. That consolidation right there, that it was in there. There was a lot of flow coming in on Tesla calls. A lot. So when the market opens, it was it was about I think like a nineteen to one on the, the call side, and I realized that if it breaks in that consolidation, that that resistance of one sixty eight or one sixty eight point five around there, if it holds that consolidation, then we're gonna bounce. And our goal was to clear the gap all the way up to like one seventy point five or so. 170.5. Yep. Pre market high ish. Yep. 171. Yep. That was our first target right there. So that was that was the first trade that we did. Um, then the second target, let me see, because I, I, I have more written down, is the gap, the consolidation from yesterday, the day prior, uh, consolidation on pre market, which is 173. Oh yeah, I was in VC when you did this, I think. Yep. And that that's where uh that was our final target. Anything above that is gravy. But that was our two main targets, 170.8 and 173. And we bought them literally at 168.8 or 168.85 or something like that. Sure. Simple. Yep. Resistance and support. And I think the important thing to note, Flips, is that you, obviously support and resistance were a big part, but especially trading so close to the open like you usually do, it's pretty hard to just trade off support and resistance, right? You need more than that. You're looking at right, flow. You're right. looking at volume. You're looking at the options contract flow. You're not just looking at key levels because Correct. key levels so close to the open, it can be difficult, right? I mean, price is so volatile. Things are moving so quick that if all you care about is key levels, a lot of the times it's it's going to be really difficult. I mean, you got to be right. looking at more than key levels normally, but especially when you trade the way that Flip says, which is something that he does great. I, I don't, I don't fully know how he does it. <laughs> <laughs> Still doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's that's pretty much how we found the level, and now that of course, or we have targets, big targets on the upside. With a very tight stop loss. If we break below that, that consolidation, that's your stop. So you can lose 30 cents, 35 cents on the downside for a possible three dollars to the upside. Right. So that's a trade that I'll take all day long. Right. It's flips his favorite, that risk to reward. Yep. There you go. Beautiful. All right. Thanks for the examples, flips. Always much appreciated. So that's kind of the first um, idea to cover there is, is really reviewing some of, I love always reviewing flips as trades because I know most people could probably relate to that. And I, I think most people should be able to relate to that considering uh, everybody should be in flips with VC every day, but that's, that's a secondary point. Um, that said, I want to just run through kind of some daily charting, uh, run through charting on the daily, uh, talk a little bit about how that might work uh, and the types of routines that you should have. Uh, on a weekly basis and, and even on a daily basis. So since Lips is here, we'll start with his favorite stock, uh, AMD, of course. Um, 
when I'm charting any stock, uh, always it starts on the weekly, sometimes monthly, but usually on the weekly. And something like AMD, uh, I'm always going to mark the key levels that I can see, um, like these swing highs or swing lows that are relevant. And the most kind of relevant level to me here on AMD is this previous all-time high. So this is one, I'm always going to mark uh, those previous all-time highs as those should always be really, really big support, which mark that out. I like to personally give it a name and change the color to orange, uh, just so I always know exactly how important that level is when I look at it. And you can see, I mean, look at how nicely we respected that previous all-time high months and months after originally making it to that level. I mean, you could see so many days and bounces off of this level, even on the four hour. I mean, this was just an absolute printer level so many times. I mean, one, two, three, four, we closed below it in pre-market and came back above. Uh, five, there we finally closed below it. So, I mean, five times this level worked before we finally broke below it. Uh, I mean, that's that's a lot of money. Uh, to be made off of one key level, right? All you need is one significant level. So that's kind of the first rule of thumb for me, always marking those previous all-time highs uh, as those every single time are going to be significant. The next way that I like to mark levels, and I'm just going to clear this one off just to make things a bit, a bit more clear, is paying attention to pivots in the trend. So if we just simplify this, right? If we were to simplify this chart, uh, and, I, and I, this isn't something that I recommend doing, I just want to do this really quickly, this line chart, right? Line chart, generally not a great way to look at charts. However, just to illustrate this concept, I wanted to show you really this, really quick. Um, an important level is always going to be found where the trend reverses or continues. So for example, what that would look like on a line chart is this area, this area, that area, there, 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 and there, right? So these are all pivots in the trend. So if I just mark these out roughly, right? Just roughly. And then switch back. You can see the idea, right? Every single one of these levels ended up being significant in the future. So for example, when we created this first pivot, once we break through it, we got a nice move higher, right? Here, this 147 area acted as resistance. And here, right, right around that 172 area acted as a reasonable support and has acted as a support low this current week, right? And again, that was super crude. I, I don't really recommend doing that. That was really just to illustrate the point. Uh, in terms of actually drawing out some levels, let's go ahead and do a couple. So starting out, previous all-time high. Again, always one I'm going to chart out. And I do recommend labeling your levels. It's actually something that I see Empanada do a lot, which I really like. I don't know if I've ever seen Flips label his levels, but I think they're just colored, so they're pretty much labeled. But just to show you Empanada's charts, I actually really like them. You can see labeled. He's got yesterday high of day, overnight high, yesterday low of day. I really like that system personally. I, I, I definitely recommend doing that because then you look at a level and you know exactly what it is. Rather than just having a price level, you don't always know exactly where it's from or why it's there. Um, next, marking out a couple more pivots here. Um, looks like there's some resistance around this area. We got a couple bodies around this area, but not really a clear level here on the weekly. So I'm just going to mark that out uh, and kind of make a note for myself to take a look at that on the daily. Uh, and that's really it for the weekly. So nothing too significant or concrete here for me. Moving on to the daily, uh, you can see now we should have a little bit clear of an idea of where that level should be. To me, actually, it looks like that level should be right there right there. And what I usually do is name this something like daily pivot. This is where we have some daily resistance. And the reason that I chose this level uh, is because there's two kind of really suspicious bodies off of the exact same level. That's actually pretty rare to see something like that, where this candle closes at 181.86 and this candle opens at the exact same level. That's actually very uncommon. So that's something that I'm going to mark. Uh, next thing I'm going to mark is right here. And you can see that was literally the low of the week because this is the high of a gigantic bull gap. That's what I usually do. Change this, turn that off, label this bull gap and show that on the right. And boom, now we know that level. Uh, same idea here. I'm going to mark this level right here. There's just a small bear gap still open there. So I'm just going to mark that bear gap.
And already we have an excellent, excellent group of levels. I mean, you could tell how quickly it was, how quickly we threw those together and how good they are. I mean, this clearly shows that we're just sitting in this prior range, right? So right now we're technically in a range. And of course, flips got long at the dead bottom <laughs> of the range, <laughs> which is exactly what you should do. And the dead bottom of the range happened to be coupled with a couple different patterns and flow and volume on the lower time frames, which is exactly what you'd want to see. So boom, right? There's kind of that daily charting on AMD. Flips, I know, loves the four hour. I started looking at the four hour after I found out that Flips does it so much, but I didn't used to look at the four hour uh, very much. Um, four hour, you could start to take a look. Maybe there's some trends that you didn't notice from the daily. That's a trend that I draw right there, right? Three wicks off that same trend. Actually I traded, I, I trained AMD on the four hour from the gap from uh, Wednesday. Um, go back, go back, go back. More more Wednesday, more another Wednesday. Keep going. Oh, the other Wednesday here? Right there, right there. All the way up, up on the correct. Oh, from right there. here? Yep. Oh, I was going to see if it's the same thing. So down like that. Yeah. yeah. So you see the. And now shift it to the five minute and look at today. Hey, let me let me make it a little better. I'll get it on the hourly here. Yep. There you go. There we go. Pretty close. Yep. So there's your trend line on the on the four hours. So you see how we touch one seventy six. Yep, that's your four-hour trend line. Which also happens to be right around yesterday's lows. Yesterday's lows. Yep. So you have you have a, a trend on the downside, plus you have a, a key support where AMD had the previous day bounce. So around between one, 176.3 to 175.8 is a, is a buyer's area. So that I took the next week's Friday and I'm swinging those. Mm, of course, at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, you just use your Always. four hours, your four hour trend, plus your your key support from the previous day, and you can do that on the like almost like a double bottom. And my target is going to be one eighty one point five, or the bear gap all the way to one eighty seven. Oh man. Yep. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, right to 187. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, as you guys can see, right, going through a couple different time frames, really getting all the levels is not incredibly difficult. I mean, I really don't think it's too hard to do this. Um, all it really takes is practice, right? Um, I think. I can say pretty confidently that I think either flips or I could look at most charts and find the best levels really quick. I think flips, I'll, I'll say flips is probably a bit better. Um, but I think mostly it's, it's, it's not a hard thing to do though. I think anybody could get as good as either of us rather quickly. I, I really think that finding key levels is not hard and, and correct me if I'm misspeaking there flips, but I don't think it's very difficult. It's all just about pattern recognition. I mean, once you find a couple uh, of those patterns and memorize them, it's, it's really all the same idea, right? I mean, uh, it is. I mean, it is. Yeah. And I mean, then, the uh, it just, it requires you to put a little bit of homework. Exactly. What a lot of people do not like to do. So no. it's, it's pretty much, you know, you have to trade cold. You can get your emotions after you're in a trade, but you have to trade cold and it just takes homework. It takes hope for you to, you know, go back when the days close and literally spend an hour, 30, 30 minutes to an hour on charting on setting up for your next tomorrow's trades and what you're looking for. So exactly. definitely AMD is on my watch list for tomorrow. Some AMD uh, calls. So Let's go. that's definitely on watch for me. So I'll be watching that tomorrow. Yep. We're going to hit it flips for sure. I mean, ideally, Let's see, where do we want to hit it tomorrow? Looks like over 180, that's easy. Over 180 up to 182. Right there. Big pivot today on that in the morning. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, really the big part about any technical analysis is all just practice, right? It's just going through the motions time and time again. Um, 
and just taking a shot. But all these levels, I mean, we got these in 10 minutes, right? Or less. Um, this simple one, orange was from the weekly, right? The bull gap, anybody can see that, right? Big gap on the daily, you always got to mark that out, right? Those highs and lows of those bull gaps are always going to be significant. And no coincidence, that's the low of the week, right? This also not something that you see every day, right? A pivot exactly on the same two bot or on two different bodies at literally the exact same level. That's very uncommon. And it's not something that you see often. So that's always something I'm going to mark. Oh, Flips is out of here. All right, Flips. Hey, thanks so much for your time. Everybody show some love to Flips for showing up. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. We'll see you tomorrow on VC. Let's kill it. You guys tomorrow night. Tomorrow night? Uh, tomorrow for trading. Tomorrow Today's night, man. I'm tired. <laughs> Go to bed, man. You can't even talk. <laughs> you can't even talk. Get out, bro. Hey, everybody's right. throwing the green frogs for you. Yeah, you got to go to sleep, dude. All right. Hey, we appreciate you. Man, poor guy couldn't even speak. He's saying, I'll see you, I'll see you tomorrow night. I'll see you tonight. <laughs> What'd you guys do to him in BC today, man? You guys, you guys violated him. All right. So again, right, finding these levels isn't something that's too labor intensive, right? I mean, we found all these real quick. It's just recognizing some of these patterns here on the daily. Um, I mean, really, we just marked out two of these gaps here on the daily, found these two pivots on the weekly, zoomed in. And I mean, we could look at any time frame, right? I like the 30 minute defined levels and you can validate these levels. You can see this 182 level very clearly is important. 180, 188 area very clearly is important, right? And here we could prepare for tomorrow right now. How would you prepare for tomorrow? Well, we have yesterday low of day. Uh, I'd also probably duplicate this. Let's see, yesterday low of day. Let me change this really quick and just make it yesterday's low of day. I'm going to put it right there. And yesterday high of day. And in this case, I'm not putting it at the exact highs and lows. I personally feel like the pivots here are actually just a bit better. Uh, like, for example, we have two bodies here rather than these wicks don't, don't quite line up. And also this yesterday high of day level here also lines up with this consolidation in the prior day. Uh, and same thing here, right? This yesterday low of day, we have three wicks or we have a wick and two bodies right in the same area. Uh, so these are the two levels I'd be watching on AMD going into tomorrow, right? Yesterday low of day, yesterday high of day. Um, and then our pre-market levels that get formed into the next day. And the best way that I like to remember where my levels are at is just set a couple alerts. Set an alert there, set an alert there. And that way, when price gets close to my levels, I get an alert on my phone or on my computer, and I know, hey, it's time for me to pay attention. So that's a, a very simple but comprehensive example on AMD. Now, now that we've completed this kind of first example, does everybody have a general idea of, of kind of that procedure that we went through? So what I might be looking for tomorrow is this break over 180, right? Key psychological level, yesterday's high of day with my first target being my next key level at 182, right? I also might consider a target here around these wicks, right, 181, but next big level is gonna be 182, right? That's it. And if I was trading short, I'd look for a breakdown of this 175.7 and my main target would be 172, right? And I'd look and zoom out and see if there's anything in the way really stopping me from that level. And the only thing I might identify, at least in the recent term, is this pivot here. So maybe there's another pivot right around there, right? So that might be where I trim some of my position, trim some there. But really, it's not too complex, not too complex. Does anybody have any questions, comments about the procedure? Some people talk about support and resistance zones. Do you think it, that it's better to establish those? Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, instead of establishing support and resistance zones, the way I like to think about support and resistance lines is as a zone. And this is something that Shark I mean, he must have told me this two years ago now. Shark told me when I was first kind of getting mentored by him, he told me very specifically, I, I had problems with executing trades. I wouldn't, wouldn't execute trades. Um, I was too kind of unconfident to do it. Uh, and when my level would break just a little bit, I'd get confused and, and I wouldn't take the trade. And one thing, well, two things that Shark told me, and I saw a question about this earlier. Number one, and one of my favorite pieces of advice that I ever heard from Shark was swing the bat. And what that means is if the opportunity pre presents itself and it's part of your plan, why would you not take the trade, right? If price comes down into your level of support, you see that buy volume pick up, you see that options flow hit, your EMAs are in a positive trend, your daily charts still looking constructive, swing the bat, take the opportunity, 
take the risk because ultimately in the market, if you're scared to lose, you're never going to win, right? You have to be comprehending that every time you take a trade, you are risking your hard earned capital, whether you like it or not. And if you don't fully accept that risk, and if you don't fully understand that you can and will lose money in the stock market, it will be impossible to be successful. So you have to wrap your head around that fact and come into the market every single day with a plan and understand that all you are there to do is execute on your plan, nothing else. That's the first point. Number two, when paying attention to support and resistance zones, it's important to think of them more as kind of a blurred line, right? And again, another thing that Shark told me that I'll relay, relay to you all is that when looking at a chart, squint. And this might sound weird, but if you squint at the chart that I have on the screen right now, those support and resistance zones or lines get a little bit more blurry, right? If I'm squinting right now and I'm looking at this area, I can't really tell that we broke that level. And if I'm squinting and looking at this level, eh, I can't really tell that we broke it, right? So don't think that whatever support and resistance levels that you find, they are going to bounce to the exact stent every single time. It's just not going to happen. It never has and it never will. Your levels aren't always going to be perfect to the cent. What matters is that your levels are in generally the right area, plus or minus, you know, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 cents, maybe even a dollar. But for me, I have always preferred levels over zones. Now, that's not to say that support resistance zones aren't useful. There's plenty of legendary traders that trade based off of supply and demand zones. Me personally, my opinion is that it just comes down to preference, right? If you prefer thinking about support and resistance in terms of a zone rather than a line, then draw it as a zone. Like for example, some examples of that might look like me having this daily pivot at 182, but also extending the zone up just a little bit. I think one important thing to be mindful of though, when drawing support and resistance zones is not to get carried away. One thing that I see people doing really commonly is that when they draw a support and resistance zone, it looks something like this. And it's a four buck support and resistance zone. And it's like, no, that's that's wrong. That's that's not how that works. And, and they're throwing precision entirely out the window. So you have to have kind of a, a limit there uh, where you're gonna stop yourself from doing something, I'll call it just kind of outlandish like that. So I think nothing wrong with support and resistance zones, but I think you have to be careful when implementing them. Um, and personally, my preference, and I think a lot of other traders will, would agree with me here, is that at least in, in the OOT, is that the, the preference for us is generally support and resistance levels. I think it's just um, a bit more intuitive for me um, is, is kind of how I would put it. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yeah, and again, just to address that comment that I saw earlier about somebody asking, you know, the, the trading is the hardest part, right? You have to just do it, right? All you have to do when you trade is click buttons. And when you drill it down to something that dumb, right? It sounds so silly that you can't click the button, but that's literally all we need to do is just click the button. Um, so when you come into the day with a plan and price breaks your trigger level, bounces on your trigger level, or shows up in an area where you're interested and you've already planned this trade out, just click the button. I mean, it's that's it. Just, just click the button. You're done, right? Just do that. That's what you're here to do. All you have to boil down to is click the button. When you show up and click the button, you should have your profit targets defined, your risk levels defined. And that way you're not scared. You're not worried. You're not concerned. You know what you're expecting, right? You know, you could lose a dollar, you know, you could gain two, whatever, right? You're going to wait to see if either of those happen. That's it. You have a hard time to trust your levels that they are going to bounce. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting comment, right? On one hand, you know, you come into the day with these levels and then they don't always work, right? Support resistance levels, like anything, aren't always 100% successful. And when trading based off of support resistance, you don't have to always enter right at that support level or right at that resistance level. It's completely reasonable um, to wait for the bounce off of that level. Like, for example, let's say I'm looking at this daily pivot at 181.86, right? This is a daily level. So... I should be reasonable and wait for a kind of, I can wait for a reversal signal. So if I'm looking to short AMD at this level, you can see this bar comes up, prints a long wick above, 30 minute bar prints the same thing, long wick to the upside, bear bar closing near its low. At this point, then I could short the market. 
right? I see this 30 minute higher time frame close. And that gives me some kind of confidence that we've rejected this level and the market will move lower. Now, is this the best short ever? No. I mean, this is on the lowest candle volume of the day. So it's not something that I'd short, but that's the idea, right? And same thing goes for any other types uh, of bounces or rejections. Now, one thing to note is that when you're trading the open, right? If you're trying to trade the open, like flip sometimes does, you're not going to want to wait for the hourly bar to close, right? It's just not feasible. So uh, you have to kind of adjust for the type of trade that you're taking. Um, but you can always wait for that bounce a little bit. Like you don't need to bottom tick or top tick every single trade. Uh, and even on something like, I mean, let's think if I can think of something uh, recently. Let's think of something. Um, I mean, even Marvell is a decent example, right? You can see we've got a couple different kind of bars below the 65, 75 level. Um, yeah, maybe it's not, it's not so clear. I mean, I guess either way, right? This is a weekly support level and the weekly bars are holding above this 65, 75 level. So as a result, it's not something that you should be short on, I guess is my point here. So that's just kind of my thought there. Um, yeah, the trusting your levels comes with just charting, right? If you have trouble trusting your levels, spend a month just charting out levels and studying how stocks react to them, right? And figure out ways you can improve. Uh, maybe things are doing wrong. I think some kind of common misconceptions to get into are people create too many levels or they kind of create too many levels on the lower time frames, um, which those are always different traps to fall into. Does that answer your question there, Rudy? Cool. Even something like Mara, right? For example, going into tomorrow, right? It might be a little bit harder to trade this name. Um, you know, it's got that crypto name. It's a little bit more volatile, a little bit more difficult. But after these past couple of days, we have a big daily level at around this 20 spot, right? Which you can see exactly where I got this level from. It's this previous pivot, right? These are my real levels on Mara. And this was the level that I had, 20, right? Today and yesterday, you could see now we've gotten two bounces off of this level, right? So obviously now you'd be kind of chasing here, um, but we have a confirmed hold of this $20 level. Also, we have this hold occurring on rising volume, right? So we have multiple above average volume days holding this $20 level. So as a result, right, even though you didn't get necessarily in at the $20 level, you can use that to structure a trade based on that bias. So for example, now through this 22 point, I'll call it 22.6 area, that previous wick, you should probably be thinking to get long, right? Because now we have that confirmed hold of support. We know buyers are present in this name. So above this previous day's high, right? It's something that I'd be looking for long, right? And this is actually a trade I might even take, right? Especially because it was today's high as well. I'll even set an alert because I like that. All right. Any other questions? How do you decide whether a level is hold uh, or going to hold or give up? Uh, you've seen me look for 30 minute holds in the tab. Yeah, it depends on the time frame you're trading, first of all, as to what, um, like, how long of a, of a time frame hold you should be looking for. For example, if you're taking a swing trade based on a weekly chart, you should absolutely give zero thought into what's happening on the five minute. And that goes for every type of indication. If you are scalping something, you should not be waiting for a daily close to stop out. So first of all, it's trade your time frame, right? If you're trading something based off of a scalp below pre-market high or a scalp of the opening range, like River is always doing, right? If he's scalping the OR, um, you know, if, if he's got the OR here, right? He's scalping this uh, first close above right here. His stop should be a five minute close below this, this 521 area, plain and simple, right? You should be stopping out based on the time frame your trade is structured on. So that's the first point to be mindful of. Um, and that same goes for looking for holds, right? For example, if your trade is based on a daily um, bounce or rejection or something like that, although you might want to get a more aggressive entry, right? 
or let's say you want to get a little bit more of an aggressive entry, right? And you're looking for a daily hold of a given level. You might want to look for an hourly bounce off that level. Like for example, if you draw this pivot out right here, I guess we didn't get all the way to it. So that doesn't quite count. Um, I guess even here kind of counts, right? This, this low right here, for example, price comes to this previous day's low. These were overnight. Um, well, I guess that was into the end of the day, but price comes into this previous day's low. You can see we get an hourly hold here. That might be somewhere you take that entry, right? Or even that 30 minute close back above is somewhere where you take that entry. Um, so it's about trading the time frame. Again, if your setup is based on an hourly level, you shouldn't be too concerned about what's happening on the five minute. I think that's the most important thing to know. Does that make sense, Al Brooks? Really do like Amazon too. This thing seems close. Right through that 180 is when it gets moving. And you can see 180, real nice level, right? Previous swing highs, a couple bodies off that area. You look at the 30 minute, boom, 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 boom. Once we get above that 180, should be fun. All right, everybody. I think I'm gonna call it here for the night. One thing that I wanna offer is if you have any comments or questions or want me to take a look at the support and resistance levels at Uchart, please feel free, reach out, send me a message, and I'd love to help you kind of take a look um, and, and decipher the types of levels you should be having um, to make sure that we are all looking at the highest quality levels and uh, just help you guys practice and, and understand these concepts a little better. But overall, I couldn't recommend practicing this more. Um, it's all about, um, yeah, it's all about, what's it called? All about practice, sorry, I couldn't think of the word. Um, so. That's a big idea. Uh, Rudy, why don't you DM me and I'll see if I could prepare a couple examples for you because I think that's a question that I could spend a little bit more time answering. You good with that? Cool. All right, everybody. Appreciate all your time. I will see you guys all in the next one. Adios, everyone.